all will be revealed at some point as a prophet should. Well, I was I was actually going to ask you about the process this time because your background is a lot of solo work mm-hmm. and mixed up and mi- working with one or two people only. Mm-hmm. So how's the recording process this time where you're a group of three that all have to come together? Um, well, I guess, I don't know. I don't know how different it really was. I mean, I've, I've written with co-writers before. Uh, Chris LeBlanc has been a, a, a co-writer of mine for a number of years and, uh, and, uh, he's had co-writes on my past albums. Um, so I'm used to, I'm used to doing that, but the, it's certainly because the direction we decided to take with this was, I don't know, more along the lines of, um, a collaborative effort where we were all going to have some input into the songs and be credited equally and stuff like that. Cause I'm not into song splits and stuff. You hear stuff these days, like, you know, mm-hmm. 15 co-writers in a room for some awful pop hit. And then they're like assigning, you know, like these ridiculous percentages to what effort went in. It's like, well, you get 3% of the song. It's like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. So you know what? I don't care. Whatever your effort was, if you made my song better, um, the, the idea I brought to the table, then we're going to split that 50-50 because, you know, I mean, 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. If you can mm-hmm. improve my song, then then we're good to go. And I'm going to credit you equally. I've done that with my son. I've done that with my daughter. I've done that with Chris and, and uh, a guy that I've played with for years and sort of our, our you know, jamming on Wednesday night band, Rob Williamson, um, and, and, and other people as well. Uh, Mark Donato. Uh, is another guy who, you know, took a song that I had and, and made it awesome. So uh, I haven't recorded that one yet. That'll be on my next project. So the the process, like people kind of get wrapped up in the idea of process. Like, what's your process? And some people do have a process and that's cool. I don't really. Um, typically it's bring the song to the table. Let's listen to it. And it's like, hey, you know what? Like, why don't you try instead of that line, try this, mm-hmm. you know, Um, instead of, you know, putting the, you know, this being the bridge, why don't we try something different as far as that goes? And some people break that down into arranging and writing. And for some people, those are different, but for me, that's all part of it. So if you change an arrangement for me and, and make the song better by doing that, I kind of consider that to be writing as well. So the three of us getting together, first of all, we're all friends and we all know each other really well. I've known Mm -hmm. Brent for a year. I don't know. That since I moved to Sudbury a long time ago and, and Chris and I have written together a lot. So um, there's a pretty high comfort level and uh, and there has to be sometimes with co-writing. Like I've heard of some miserable co-writing relationships because, you know, somebody tries to make a change and then somebody is getting all defensive about, you know, well, you can't change that. You can't change this. Well, so the that, comfort level definitely, that, would, that plays the role, that makes a difference in actually making it a natural process. Oh yeah, for sure. And then, I mean, <laughs> we didn't like we didn't exactly knock this out fast. Um, you know, the bio on the puck hogs, the the Coles notes is that we got together for a, um, a, a hockey night in Canada music contest that was nationwide, and there was like well over a thousand artists who entered it, and we managed to come in runner up. Uh, so second out of over a thousand was pretty good for three, you know, dudes from Sudbury. Yeah, it's pretty impressive for a last minute project. Yeah, it just kind of came on and Chris was like, Hey, this, this, this contest is going on. Um, you know, let's, let's enter a song. It's like, cool. And we started writing it right away and then we brought, and that's how it all came to be. This is like five years ago. So we're like not exactly riding the wave of success right now that we, maybe we could have been surfing at the time. Um, and it took us a couple of years to sort of like finish with that song. We raised some money for uh, the Human League of Sudbury to help kids get into sports and that. So all the sales from the song went to that. And then we we're like, well, maybe we should make a record. I was like, sure. Yeah, that's we, not a bad idea at that point. Why not? Yeah, but you get like that's two years in, and then you get like three, uh, you know, fathers who are, you know, self employed and. Uh, you try and knock something out. It's like if you miss Wednesday night, or, you know, it's like, okay, I guess we'll see you um, in a month. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, things went pretty slowly, but that's okay too. Brent's got his studio, Artifact Media, and we, uh, you know, so it was always, we could always go in and we could always do a little something. So we, you know, the, everything came together. It took us a few years. So it's five years after the contest. We finally got something out. I, th- I think, you know, people, people still come up and say, you should have won. So they know who we are at least. No matter where you hear your song coming out of a set of speakers that aren't yours, 
you're like, oh, this is great. Like, you know, um, but it's, it's a, it's something people chase, right? You know, you want that, you want that radio play. Um, but we, you know, I think stylistically, uh, it can be really hard. Um, and, and chasing that radio play can kind of, I don't know, um, you want to put it? Yeah, you know, I'll take this off. Well, it's also too. I mean, he's taking pictures of me, so I want to. I want one that doesn't have the uh, conference. <laughs> that doesn't look like you're actually at work. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, but it's. Uh, but actually, that is a good point, right? Because you sort of like we. You mentioned that it's a style. There's a stylistic thing with it, and that there isn't one style in their album. Yeah. So expand on that and genre, and actually fitting a genre or not. Yeah, fitting it or not, exactly. Like, we don't really, I don't know what you'd call us, like, old guy music or, um, you know, like, acoustic folk rock or it's hard to fit, it's hard to fit into any one thing. And this record doesn't. So here's, here's what happens. Like, I come from a radio background. I did radio, like, for a long time. Been on the radio since I was 17. And, you know, you've always had these formats, right? You work in a format. And within, so you only play music that fits that format. So it's rock, it's rock, it's country, it's country, all that stuff. When I first started, actually, contemporary hit radio was really, it was a, it was the most interesting format because you played everything that was a hit. Mm -hmm. And there was, there tended to be a lot more um, influences that came together and everything didn't have to fit. But it seems that programmers have the idea that now that their programming all has to match. So it tends to be like, am I listening to the same song or is this a different one? Like, I don't know. To almost make it sound like it's one consistent station? It seems like it. I don't know. Yeah. So I guess that's I guess that's it. I mean, I'm being disingenuous. Of course that's it. I mean, I was a program director and music director. <laughs> I, know, I know what they're shooting for. Um, what it does, though, is like artists, you know, if they're forced to chase that, sometimes that, you know how that whole thing, like, I used to like them, but now I don't. You know, when they were indie, they were awesome. And their first album was so great. Ah. Well, you know, often that somebody got their hooks in them and we're like, yeah, but if you do this, then we can totally get a whole bunch of songs on the radio, at rock radio. Or something and the band's like, like great. Mm -hmm. I will. I'm there. <laughs> right. Well, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to make a living, that's kind of, well, it does, it's not the only way to do it, but it is one way to do it. right? Mm -hmm. uh, or to, you know, get some popularity through airplane and everything. We don't necessarily care for that like i said ray ray radio, radio plays great but it's not the end goal necessarily i don't think any of us really knows what our end goal is with this but so so on this disc we just brought songs to the table and made them better like i said in the songwriting process and and uh, whoever brought it to the table tended to do the lead vocals on it um not necessarily a reflection of the writing splits or anything like that and then you know so you got like um, you know, a Dr. John inspired sort of New Orleans, you know, jazz blues to, you know, uh, that's Hammock in the Shade to the, you know, the rock vibe of Summer Storm, which is about the last concert the hip did, mm -hmm. um, to, um, you know, pretty straight ahead, um, you know, country, like I'd rather sit here and drink beer to whiskey, Yeager and beer. All of our alcohol songs, by the way, tend to be brought to the table by Chris. And I don't know if that's a reflection on him and his liver or not, but I, I'm just, yeah, saying. I suppose that's up to the listener to decide. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, and whiskey, Yeager is kind of more of an outlaw country tune. And then wishing I was fishing just kind of popped out of us. And that was like, uh, you know, the reggae influence came, um, but what does that do to us as a band? Well, I mean, it can ha it can it can be a drawback mm -hmm. because let's say Summer Storm were to become like the single, which it kind of is. You know, that's right. kind of the one that we're pushing to. You know, some of the radio stations. Well, somebody buys the disc expecting to hear a whole bunch of other rock songs like that, and what they get is this real kind of melange of other influences and styles. They have to be a pretty serious music fan to dig it. Um, if they're not a serious music fan, and honestly, I'm going to say probably most of your fans would, are music fans. I, think. I would, I would like to think that, but like if some casual, you know, person listening to the radio heard it, um, I don't want to like, I'm not denigrating anybody. People's tastes are their tastes and that's cool. Whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. But I don't think 
you know, I, I want to attach a percentage, but there's a percentage of people who aren't like music fans. It's just background noise to them. And, oh, I like that song. So it has a good beat and I can dance to it. Kind of it used to be the whole thing. So they hear that. They pick up the disc. Well, now they're like, well, this really sucks. It's not all rock and roll songs. Yeah, I hate this band. I don't know what they sounded like. Right. Yeah. You know, they made me buy their disc. Like, I mean, yeah, dude, you can stream it on Spotify. We don't make any money that way. So, uh, you know, if right? that makes you feel better. <laughs> but uh, but it is it is everywhere music can be found because you want, you know, people to be able to hear your songs. But anyway. But does that, like, rest. that actually is a really interesting thing because there's some bands that pander to an audience. Mm-hmm. Because that that gets some airplay or it yeah. gets some festival slots. Yeah. Then there's other artists that just stick with their niche mm-hmm. and they stay where they are. So does that is that a big factor when you write? Do you think okay, I want to appeal to the music lovers because yeah, that's who cares. I write music that I'd like to listen to. That's what I do. Um, so whatever whatever that ends up being, that's what mm-hmm. ends up being. Um, there's, you know, there's varying levels of success in the music industry, and I am not successful in the music industry by any, you know, standard of how much money I've made or how much airplay I've received or anything like that. But, you know, I do what I do, and I enjoy it, and, and I have my own reasons for doing it. And like I said, sometimes I don't even know what those reasons are. They can they can change. Um, but for a band who's really chasing success and you know, wants to go that route, that's cool. I'm not even questioning whether or not that's just... I mean, what pops out of you is is what pops out of you. And Mm -hmm. I can certainly do, like, an entire rock record if I wanted to. I could do a whole Outlaw Country record if I wanted to. I've written, like, hundreds going on thousands of songs here. And, uh, And so I suppose I could gather 10 or 12 together and put them on a disc. The other thing is, though... It's expensive, dude. It's yeah. Not, it's, it's, you know, people have this idea that music's free and it's not free. I mean, even recording this in Brent's studio, Artifact Media. Um, Shout out to Artifact Media, of course. Yes. Um, there, there are costs involved. You, you know, he had to buy the equipment. We had to, you know, we had to buy our, our instruments. We had to spend the time learning to use them. And that's just scratching the surface. We still got CDs printed and there's still marketing efforts and there's all kinds of stuff that goes into it and the costs multiply and stuff. So I think that part of it becomes an economic thing. Mm-hmm. And the fact that a lot of people can just do home recording now has changed the, the way music works. And I, 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 Maybe another time we could expand on for the better or for the worse, or you could do that with somebody else, you know? I mean, what, what has it done to the industry? Because people have different opinions about that. Mm-hmm. But it used to be at least, it kind of still is, that cost is still a factor. So if you're going to try and recoup that money, and the way you think you're going to do that is by getting booked in certain kinds of venues... Mm-hmm. And getting airplay on certain kinds of radio stations, etc. Like you said, you know, booked into certain kinds of festivals, attracting a specific kind of fan, then you do have to probably have some consistency. Right. And the people who don't sometimes suffer for it. Like my um, favorite songwriter and greatest influence would be Steve Earle. Um, and Steve came up through sort of the Nashville, Austin, you know, down Texas, that kind of scene. And he, he played with all the towns, Van Zandt and Guy Clark and, and Rodney Crowell and all this, like kind of the, the beginnings of that outlaw country movement and stuff like that. And then he got a record deal and what would now be considered to be more outlaw country anyway, was sort of at the time it was, it was new country. So he did guitar town and exit zero mm-hmm. and, um, you know, people were along for the ride. He was receiving radio play and then he released Copperhead road and there were rock songs on it. And it was like country music listeners heads exploded and they didn't know they didn't know what to do with it they didn't know what to make of it and all of a sudden he was getting played at like aor like album radio formats and stuff and so they lost their ownership of him and they didn't know what to make of it and they didn't necessarily like like half the disc because the other half was pretty standard country like he'd always been writing Mm -hmm. and i remember getting to sudbury and going to work at ci gym that was the country station on the time it was an am station i was like where's all the steve earl in the playlist like oh there's no steve earl on the playlist he like betrayed country listeners I was like, <laughs> by, by writing a song that was successful 
You know, what's that about? But it it ultimately, like, I don't think Steve Earle cares. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I've been following him for a long time. I've met him a couple of times. I didn't have any deep conversations. But, you know, he's like a pure artist. He's going to write what he's going to write. And I guess that's kind of where I get. I'm just going to write what I'm going to write, and I'm going to I'm going to record what I want to listen to, and I'm going to hope that everybody else wants to listen to it. But there's no question that over the course of his career, um, that had an effect. And even though Copperhead Road is probably his biggest, most well known songs, um, it probably uh, derailed his career. And had he just continued writing those country songs that fit into the country format, mm-hmm. you know, he might sound like, I'm not allowed to swear on the radio, or I, at least I, I know it's campus radio, but I don't want to, because I'm an old school radio guy, and there's a microphone on. But he'd sound like effing Florida Georgia Line or something yeah. like that, you know, had he been the one who wanted to go down that road. But he didn't, and I admire that. There's a lot of artists that I admire, and they tend to be the ones who just release their music. And hope somebody wants to listen to it. And that's kind of what, that's, I guess, for, you know, that's that's pretty much where we went with this. Yeah, that's the best way to do it, though, right? I mean, that's that's where the passion comes out of it. and I think so. And I think people recognize when that passion's not there. And that's why a lot of these, you know, blow-dried looking, overly friggin', you know, overly styled and, you know, stuffed and whatever they are, like... You know, ultimately, as a music fan and the other people that I know are music fans, you see that sort of fake ersatz kind of thing coming out. And I just mm-hmm. I just don't want to have any part of it. But a lot of people do. So all the power to them. You hey, know, because, might as well. Yeah, man. You know, who cares if you're flash in the pan? You experience something I didn't. If you're out there, you know, playing stadiums and stuff for a while, that's cool. But uh, it ain't for us. Although... I'm not saying we wouldn't like to play a stadium. So anybody listening right now who's booking stadium shows, man, the Puck Hogs, are, are, we're there for you. If you need us to, like, replace the Stones or something like that, we're so in. We the Puck so Hogs in. are ready for you. 100%. So you're going to play a bunch of songs. Yeah, we're uh, going to play... <clears throat> I was thinking we could actually play uh, Hammock in the Shade, throw a little... Ch- mix things up. Yeah, sure. That sounds good. So, yeah, this is... And Dr. John just left us. He did, um, which is very was, unfortunate. Yeah, very unfortunate. But you know, like he had a good run. And I'm sure he's had a he had a pretty uh, interesting life and stuff. So, um, you know, and he left us with a legacy of such fantastic music. And I got to say that the piano on this track was provided by a friend of mine who I've known for many years, named Peter Learn, who's just like my favorite piano player. Um, so when when he said like, well, where do you want to go with this? I was just mm-hmm. like, Doctor John. And he's like, okay. Actually, let's uh, let's let's change things up a bit and actually sure. play your favorite Doctor John track to give people a sample of where yeah, it's okay. coming from. Well, then that we'll would go be, to Hammock. Well, that would be uh, that would be such a night. I mean, I know it's it's uh, it's one of his more well known songs, but this is one of those tunes, and I'll kind of leave it. You know, like I write simple songs, uh, and I I don't make any apologies for that. The songs I write are simple. Um, I admire people who write complicated songs or who, you know, emote in some kind of very poetic way, but I don't. And what I, this song, I get goosebumps just thinking about it because it's so simple, but it's so awesome. And to write a chorus that's just, if I don't do it, somebody else will. That says so much to me, just that, because like I have... That night, yes, I have absolutely had that night. And there's so many like cool epic stories and like probably really tragic sad stories that have started with, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will. So when he captured that, it's like, wow, dude, you like you nailed it. So I love the story behind this song, mm-hmm. and I love the fact that the music is like boozy and kind of like captures the spirit of the song, like this crazy night. And, uh, and I just love everything about it. So uh, I thank Dr. John for having written that and inspired Hammock in the Shade, which we can move on to. And then after that, uh, you go ahead and play whatever you want, as long as it's yeah. Storm and Whiskey, Acre and Beer and a bunch of other Yeah, we'll do, uh, we'll, do do- <laughs> we'll, we'll do Dr. John's Such a Night and then immediately after transition into Hammock in the Shade. Cool, man. And he the influence. And shout out to, thanks for Sean for coming on. It's been my pleasure and I will come back anytime when uh, you know we can further elucidate on stuff. I know there are going to be I think there's going to be people lined up to do the show. I think you, so too. Mr. Prophet. So. There's going to be a lot of things. So where can people find you? Everywhere. Uh, we uh, 
Um, we have a website, uh, www.thepuckhogs.com. I've got my own website, and www.seanbrett.ca. Um, you know, Brent's got a website. Uh, we've, we're on Facebook, of course. We're like all over social media. We've got a Facebook page, we got Twitter, we got Instagram. We're everywhere. So it's hard not to if, find them. Yeah, really. like if you like Google the Puck Hogs or Google Sean Brett, you're going to find it all. And uh, and like we're everywhere. Basically, we're fine. Uh, music is sold, which means that we're not really in stores anymore <laughs> with our CDs, but we'll happily ship them out to you or drop them off at your door. And whatever it is, like, you know, I mean, if you like to stream, that's cool, whatever. Listen to our music, but hopefully you'll get around to buying it at some point. So, yeah, iTunes, Spotify, I'm, uh, what is it, iMusic, Apple Music. Um, yeah, no one knows at this point. Listen, listen for free on, on SoundCloud or, you know, YouTube music. I don't care. I just want you to listen to the tunes. And then at some point, maybe you'll make a decision to buy them. You can go to our Bandcamp site. Mm-hmm. We actually make money from that. So that's pretty cool. We like making we like making money. Like I said, it's nice to recoup that cash. And, you know, point zero 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 three cents a play, you don't do it very quickly. So if you're going to do that, then you need to commit to listening to my song a million times. Just on repeat. Just take a Saturday. Yeah. Commit. Absolutely. And even at two or three minutes a song, it's going to take you a little while. But yeah. Anyway, thanks, awesome. uh, thanks, well, thanks for buddy. having us in, man, I, or me in. I, I think in terms of us when I'm talking about the Puck Hogs. But um, it's half and half, right? Yeah. You're, you're half Puck Hogs, half Sean. Absolutely. So. But I just want another shout out to Chris LeBlanc and Brett Wahlberg, my uh, my brothers, my, my brother Puck Hogs, uh, who helped, uh, you know, make this amazing music we're mm-hmm. really we're really proud of the disc and we hope that people are going to uh, enjoy listening to it yeah today we had sean baird in the studio and he just shared his journey and it was a really interesting conversation about genre and style and making music because you want to i'm stoked to start it so my name is kyle vine and i appreciate you listening to the first show of the music prophet 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 show of the music prophet